Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship as we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 1 and 2 and examine Paul's godly jealousy based upon our jealous God. What does it mean when scripture says God is jealous? Is jealousy a good thing? Learn something about Paul and learn a lot about God in this study of a godly jealousy from our text in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 1 and 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, and we're going to discuss this morning the biblical teaching of a godly jealousy. And in the first two verses, we see Paul describing his love and concern for the Corinthian believers in these words. He says, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, that is speaking not of you as an individual, but as you being a part of the body of Christ. The body of Christ is to be presented to Christ, the groom, the bridegroom, as you read through the Gospels, you see Jesus referring to all the time. That's Him. He's referring to Himself. And we, as the body of Christ, are to be presented to God as a, He describes here, a chaste virgin to Christ. That is speaking, obviously, in a spiritual context. And so Paul is jealously guarding the churches from error. That's what this means. Paul does not want them committing spiritual adultery. Or even getting involved in error which could sully and soil the bride. Amen. And so this is a very godly thing. There's the false idea that jealousy is a sin. It is not. Amen. Jealousy is a sin when it ever, number one, it's unfounded. I think, Julie, you mentioned a couple weeks ago, sometimes those jealous types are guilty. And that's why they're jealous. That's not the kind of jealousy God has. That's not the kind of jealousy we should have. We should have a jealousy that is based on love and truth. And God Himself is the example of the kind of jealousy that God has. That's why Paul refers to his jealousy over believers as a godly jealousy. Because God is jealous over His people. God loves you. And if you love someone, you guard them jealously from being harmed. That's basically, in a nutshell, what we're going to look at this morning. If you don't guard someone jealously, protecting them from harm, that suggests maybe you really don't love that person. And let me say this, only the God of the Bible describes His uh, feelings for you in the word love. And only the God of the Bible jealously protects you out of love. You will not find that in any other so-called religion. Allah is just a devil who is concerned with you being obedient. Read the Quran, you will not find the word love. Isn't that amazing? Allah does not love. Allah demands submission. That's what the word Islam means. Buddhism and these other pantheistic religions, they don't even believe God is personal. He's a force. So God can't love because He's not a person in those religions. Only in biblical Christianity do you see this. So again in verse 2, read that with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, please pay attention this morning. As always, I try to bring uh, the Word of God to you clearly and you either should be reviewing something you've already heard or you're learning something new. Either way, it's something you need to grasp hold of. And this morning is no different. 
that I want you to see something that for years I did not see in this uh, uh, question of God's jealousy over His own people. So here's how Paul presents his mission. His mission is as protectorate to deliver the virgin bride to the divine groom. But there's a whole lot more to it. It's, that's the simplicity in a nutshell. But there's a lot more to it. As a matter of fact, understanding godly jealousy begins with Mount Sinai and the giving of the law. So if you want to take your Bible and turn to Exodus chapter 20. At the, in the law, look at verse 5. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. Who? Any other God than God Himself. Any other God than the God of the Bible. That includes Allah, Buddha, and fill in the blank. No other God. You shall not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. Why? For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Now, understand something. I didn't write that. Amen. <laughs> That's God's Word. Amen. And God says He has revealed Himself to you if you go off and accept any other God. And let me add this. If you adopt this modern apostasy which says, as long as you're sincere then you are violating God. You are committing a sin against God. It's a serious thing. Now, not long after giving the law, God also said this, if you turn to, over to Exodus 34. Let's read Exodus 34, 14. For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Now, am I making it up, or is God jealous over you? <laughs> With a capital J. <laughs> he basically says, jealous is my middle name. <laughs> That's basically what he's saying. No other God. No matter what you were told. <laughs> Today, you're going to be told, as long as you're sincere, and this is a whole get-alongism. Listen, that is all a part of the end times. Satan is getting ready to push on the world a false Christ. And that false Christ will unify all religions under himself. So as you see this movement to say just all paths lead to God and all gods are the same and all that, you are witnessing with your eyes and your ears the fulfillment of end time Bible prophecy. And the establishment of the Antichrist world system. And if you rebel against what you're hearing this morning, you will fall in line and you will be damned for eternity for rejecting the clear warnings of Scripture. Amen? Amen. 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 Turn over to Deuteronomy. Expands on this a little bit. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24. Deuteronomy 4, 24. And read that with me. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Now think about that. Think about it. We're not going to get into it this morning, but when it says God is a consuming fire, it is simply this. God is holy and everything that isn't will burn. People say, I don't believe hell has flames. Well, you're a fool. Because you are rejecting the holiness of God, which is His characteristic of who He is. That's right. Everything not holy goes into the fire. You say, well, I'm not holy. Well, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you put on His holiness. And so then God looks at you and doesn't see you. He sees His holy Son, that holy child, as we read in the book of Acts. And that's why it is necessary for you to be born again by faith in the death, 
burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ because if you follow any other gospel, any other God, you go in front of God at judgment, unholy, you must burn. That's what it says. That's just the reality that the modern church refuses to accept because we're too smart. We're too technologically advanced for that kind of thinking. It isn't going to change the fact that's what's going to happen on Judgment Day. Your name is not written in that Lamb's Book of Life. You do not have the holiness of Jesus Christ covering you. You are unholy. You're cast into a lake of fire. Amen. And no amount of reading books in your bookstore, no amount of seminary education, no amount of correcting the Bible with your Hebrew and Greek lexicons is going to change that. And so we're stuck with the truth. And I say praise God. Amen. Now, godly jealousy. It's God's right to be jealous. And it's our blessing that He is. If God didn't watch over us jealously, then He would not warn us of error. He would allow us to be destroyed. It is our blessing that God is jealous over us that He then protects us from being destroyed. This is something that has to be emphasized. God is not jealous of us. God is jealous for us. That one word. You have to understand, Satan always tinkers with the Word of God and just changes one little word. These new versions that are out there changing thousands of words, you need to understand how dangerous that is. Amen. You go back to Genesis chapter 3, he added the word half and changed everything. He added the word not in another place, changed, it, changed everything. Just there's one word here and one word there. Just by adding or taking away one word and by changing this from God being jealous for us to God being jealous of us, a lot of false teachers are running around convincing people that the God of the Bible is an insane nutcase. Because, trust me, if, God, if He's God and He's jealous of you, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> There's nothing that we offer to be jealous of. <laughs> but He is jealous for us. And so, we want to stop for a second and I want to show you this clip because we have mentioned this before. Just so you understand... And it, by the way, we do not hate Oprah or anybody else when we show clips like this. I would love nothing more than to see Oprah Winfrey be saved. Amen. And people have tried to explain what you're hearing this morning to her because she claims that that last slide you saw, changing God being jealous for us to God being jealous of us was the very thing that sent her over the edge and away from Christianity. Really op it's really opened my eyes up to a new way of thinking, a new form of spirituality that doesn't always align with the teachings of Christian Christianity. So my question is to you, Oprah, how have you reconciled these spiritual teachings with your Christian belief? Well, I've reconciled it because I was able to open my mind about the, um, the absolute indescribable hugeness of that which we call God. Um, I took God out of the box because I grew up in the Baptist church and there were, you know, rules and, you know, belief sy systems and doctrine. And um, I happened to be um, sitting in church in my late 20s and I was going to this church where you had to get there at, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning, or you couldn't get a seat, and a very uh, charismatic minister, and everybody was just, you know, into the sermon, and uh, this great uh, minister was preaching about how great God was, and how omniscient, and omnipresent, and God is everything, and then he said, and the Lord thy God is a jealous God, and I was, you know, caught up in the rapture of that moment until he said jealous, <laughs> And something struck me, just, and I was like, uh, I think about 27 or 28. I was thinking, God is all, God is omnipresent, God is all, and God's also jealous? 
jealous, God is jealous of me. Um, and something about that didn't, didn't feel right in my spirit because I believe that God is love and that God is in all things. And so that's when the, the, the search for something more than doctrine uh, started to stir within me. And I love this quote that uh, Eckhart has. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes in uh, chapter one where he says, man made God in his own image, the eternal the infinite and unnameable was reduced to a mental idol that you had to believe in and worship as my God or you our God. Jesus says you are the light of the world. That means you are the consciousness in which the world appears, is seen. So you believe what happens to us at death when the body dies? I you don't, don't have a belief. I don't give it any thought. You don't. God, in the essence of all consciousness, isn't something to believe. God is. Yes. God is. Yes. And God is a feeling experience, not a believing experience. That's right. And if, and if, you're, if that your religion is a believing experience, if God for you is still about a belief, then it's not truly God. No. That's what you're saying. Yes. And, and there you have millions of people are following that kind of stuff. And that's what leads to this kind of quote that I got off of her program in another place where she was quoting Alexander Smith. I'm not even sure who that is. Listen to this quote. Love is but the discovery of ourselves in others and the delight in the recognition. In other words, I'm so wonderful that I found someone who reminds me of me. What a delight. I love you, Jenny. You're just like me. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If Jenny was just like me, we'd not be married right now. I mean, I am who I am, but I did not want to marry a Greg Miller in a dress. <laughs> Notice that she even said, I mean, they're making up a God out of thin air. And yet accuses us of doing that. We didn't make up anything. We got it right from God's Word. Amen. If I were to make up God, He would not have been anything like the God of the Bible. I'm honest with you. If it had been up to me, God would be a whole lot different. First of all, He'd love sports. I mean, the God of the Greg Bible would have been a sports fan. And Judgment Day would have had something to do with competition in sports. I mean, it would have been something you know, along those lines. And heaven would, first of all, not be in the New Jerusalem or in Jerusalem. It would be right there at the horseshoe. That'd be... Amen? If I'm making up a God, that's what... So, I didn't make up the God that I would have made up. I read the Bible and got it right from the Bible. Now, God is jealous, as we showed, not of Oprah, not of you, but for you. God loves her, and God loves you, and God loves me, and He does not want us to destroy ourselves by following devils. That's all it comes down to. He desires our faithfulness, and He protects us from destruction. Now, that's a pretty good God. Amen. That's not appreciated. And Israel didn't appreciate it. Deuteronomy 32.16, they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods like Allah the moon god and, and uh, Baal and all these other false gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. Amen. Uh, he wasn't appreciated. And when Israel provoked God to jealousy with false gods, God provoked Israel to, jealous, to jealousy with a false nation. This is where we get back to that bride that we were talking about a moment ago. Before I move on to that, I just want to throw this in there. It's just like you being a parent. I, Kathy and Steve, I'm sure, would not let Travis, if he decided he wanted to... I like Pastor Greg. I'm, I'm going to let him adopt me. I'm going home with him. Bye. <laughs> you wouldn't let that happen. Oh, man, I don't like you. I like Pastor Greg. And you'd be like, shut up. <laughs> hey, 
you wouldn't let your kid do that. Well, God won't let you because you're His kid too. Amen. He is your heavenly Father and He's not going to let you go home with Lucifer or any of Lucifer's relatives. And every one of those false gods is a relative of Lucifer. Amen. And that's all this is about. How can you not appreciate a God like that? How can you turn on Him the way people are and talk so bad about our God when our God loves us and He's not going to let us make stupid decisions and go off with Lucifer and his relatives and be destroyed? That should make you say, Thank you, God. Amen. But God was provoked to jealousy and then He provoked Israel using his Gentile bride. Romans chapter 10 and verse 19. And Paul says, But I say, did not Israel know? First, Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. So this isn't anything new. This was laid down in the Old Testament by Moses in the Pentateuch. That he's telling Israel through Moses that you will walk away. He just says that you're going to walk away. You're going to worship false gods. And I'm going to then, being provoked to jealousy, I'm going to provoke you to jealousy. And I'm going to do so with a people that are no people. That's us. What's that mean? Just think about it. I don't know about you. People say, what is your uh, uh, background? What's your descent? Where, where do you... I'm Heinz 57, folks. <laughs> I mean, I got some German. I got a little Dutch. Some English in there. Some Cherokee. And I'm also supposed to be related to Jesse James and uh, Richard Nixon. I am not a crook. Was that... Did it look like him? Yeah. I tell you, I am not a crook. <laughs> That's pretty good. And uh, I don't know what other background I got, but I'm, I can't claim I am one type of you know nationality. That's why when it, you notice they they'll say Hispanic or they'll say uh, Jew or they'll say African and they'll say Caucasian. You know why? Because we're all you know I don't say inbreeds, but. <laughs> We're all intermixed. And uh, we're not a nation, but yet then we come together as the church and the Bible calls us a holy nation. A people, God's people, as the church. And He is using us. And I say, use me. Because look at the fringe benefit. <laughs> You're in the body. You live for eternity. You'll spend eternity in heaven. Use me, Lord. You know, people sing it all the time. Use me, O oh Lord. <laughs> do you mean it? I do. Use me. <laughs> um, and this is why replacement theology is so stupid. There are most Christian churches today will tell you that Israel has been replaced by the church. Now think that through. God provokes a nation to jealousy after He casts them off? See, replacement theology says that Israel's been cast off and the church has replaced Israel. Then why is He provoking them to jealousy? Why would He do that? He wouldn't. And if the church is Israel, then here's the bottom line. The church is provoking the church to jealousy. The church is provoking Israel to jealousy, and if the church is now Israel, then the church is provoking the church. It makes no sense. <laughs> so the idea that the church is now Israel, and Israel is now the church, is insane. Amen. And it's going to lead countries like America, after the rapture especially, maybe before, but after the rapture, America will turn into Nazi Germany and turn on the Jews. And America, the old glory, red, white, and blue, is going to turn on Israel and try to kill the Jews just as fervently as Hitler. And this doctrine is making it happen today. It makes absolutely no sense. So then in Romans 11, you want to turn over one more chapter. Romans 11 and verse 11. Romans 11, 11. Read that with me. 
I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid! But rather, through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, is it any more clear? You are being saved, but it is not about you. It is not about me. We get the benefits from it. But we are being saved for the purpose of provoking Israel to jealousy. Sadly, up to this point, what they've done is just discounted the church. Well, and the Bible says that's going to change because of the tribulation. You see, God is provoking them to jealousy and they will not repent as a nation. Therefore, that 70th week of Daniel, that seven year period of the Old Testament that still hasn't played out yet, is the seventh uh, year period of Great Tribulation and that is when God is going to pour it out on Israel. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. That's why the church isn't here. We're raptured beforehand. He will also judge the Antichrist and the world system, but He's judging Israel too. Two-thirds of the Jews will be killed. Amen. A third will go into hiding, and I believe that will take place more than likely in Petra. And then Jesus returns, and they run back to Jerusalem and look upon Him whom they have pierced. Amen. And they mourn. And that's how all this jealousy business is going to play out. And that then, I hope, gives you a broader understanding of what we just read in verse 2 of 2 Corinthians 11. Read it with me again. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And that explains it. God loved His bride so much that He died for her. Every woman wants a man who loves her enough to die for her. Adam didn't eat the fruit of the vine, of the tree, before Eve. Eve ate the fruit, and then Adam ate after her, dying for his bride. And that's why he's called the first Adam. Jesus came and willingly died for his bride. He's called the second Adam. See how that all goes together? The more you study, the more you understand, and now that explains his jealousy. This morning, you need to ask yourself that question. Are you in the bride? It's simple, and it's only made difficult by man. Jesus died on the cross and paid the full price for sin. If you will believe and trust in what He's done on the cross, and that He was resurrected from the grave, He's not still dead, He's alive. Believing that, you are saved. And I don't mean to mock anything or anybody, but I just want to clarify this. You, you're not saved when you ask Jesus into your heart. You won't find that in the Bible. You receive Jesus in your heart when you believe the Gospel. That's what the Bible says. And if you will right now believe that Gospel, if you haven't already, then at that moment you receive Jesus and you're saved. Be sure to visit our website at kjvbiblebelievers.com where you can find a wealth of mp3 audio message downloads along with additional videos, articles, and links. This message is brought to you by Bible Believers Fellowship, P.O. Box 662, Worthington, Ohio, 43085. I am Greg Miller. Thank you for listening.